loneliness and love today. Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard, to not be satisfied with just a little religion when God wants so much more for us. As the series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today we wrap up a look at the Path of Loneliness with Part 7 and 8. Loneliness, my portion, is assigned. Then the final program in the series, A Love That Will Never Let Go. Joining us today, Frank Kohlinger, longtime missionary in Ecuador, who describes Elizabeth Elliot as a committed person. And Bob Lapine, longtime radio host, who talks about what comes to mind when he thinks about Elizabeth. Well, loneliness comes to each of us, especially at certain times in life. Do we ever think of it as having a higher purpose, though? Here's Gateway to Joy Program 21, The Path of Loneliness. Loneliness, my portion, is a sign. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you this time about loneliness and specifically about my portion is assigned. You remember in the old fairy stories of Hansel and Gretel or Snow White that the characters in those stories had to go through horrible things and then there was a happy ending. You remember Hansel and Gretel being so badly treated by the wicked stepmother and sent out into the forest and then they meet this wicked witch and in the end they get to pop the witch into the oven and that's the end of her. Snow White was also badly treated by a stepmother and sent out into the forest, and she meets all those wonderful little animals and dwarfs. Then, of course, there are the great uh, myths and legends of the world, such as Ulysses and the terrible things that he had to go through in order to get back home again. And it seems to be the story of everyone's life that we go through bad things, there are always dark days as well as light days. There are tough things to be endured. There are hard mountains to be climbed and rivers to be crossed and tunnels to be dug. The first real book, other than school books and story books that I ever read, was when I was 12 years old, and it was an adventure story about either the Antarctic or the Arctic, I've forgotten which, a terrible saga of suffering cold, starvation, dogs and people dying. It was a hair-raising saga of men trying to make it across the ice, uh, their ship getting stuck in the ice, the dogs dying, men dying. It was one of those horrible stories. But of course, there was a happy ending. They made it. And in any adventure story, the question is, how was it in the middle? Your life story, your own life story, what are you in the middle of now? Maybe you're in the middle of something that seems anything but likely to end happily. Maybe you're lonely, abandoned, lost your job, worried about your health, wondering whether to sell the house, whether to buy that house, where to find a place to rent, even just a room. I'd like to remind you today that our portion is assigned. Now, where did I get that idea? Straight from Psalm 16, verse 4. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. You have made known to me the path of life. That's an encouragement to me. That's one of those beacons that I steer by. The Lord has assigned me my portion and my cup and has made my lot secure. It hasn't always looked secure. It hasn't always looked as though it came from the hand of God. But looking back over a good many years now, six decades, I can say that it's true. Jesus led me all the way. He has made known to me the path of life. 
I have no idea how much of the path is left to me, but I have no question that he will make known to me the rest of it as he has done the past. One of the things which has been the greatest encouragement in my life is reading biographies. Let me strongly urge you to read biographies. Biographies of anybody, because they're all instructive. Our house was full of great Christian biographies when I was growing up. I don't think we had too many of non-Christians, but I've read a good many biographies of people who did not profess to be Christians, and I find that basically the events seem to fall into similar patterns. Things start out good or bad, they move through good or bad middles, and they end up with good or bad endings. It's the people's response to those events which builds the character. It's not the events in themselves. And the great thing about a biography is that you're not in the middle of it yourself. You can read the whole book. You can find out when the person was born, what kind of parents he had, how he grew up, what happened in his life, and how he died, so that you can get the whole picture, at least as complete as it is possible for us human beings to see one life in one piece. And it's very heartening. Among the biographies which I treasure are Anne Morrow Lindbergh's diaries, which are really autobiographies, very full and complete accounts of her life from, I think, the age of 16, when she started the first volume, which is called Bring Me a Unicorn, and carries us through five volumes, the last being War Within and Without. And she says in her introduction to that last volume, the complete story takes us through turbulent years, fame, romance, and popularity in Bring Me a Unicorn, adventure, crime, sorrow, and the sympathy of the world in Hour of Gold, Hour of Lead. Some of you may remember that the Lindbergh's little son was kidnapped, and that is what she's referring to in the crime. He was kidnapped and killed. And she tells about that in intimate detail in her book, Hour of Gold, Hour of Lead. Then the third volume, a beginning again of a flying career in a wider world, in locked rooms and open doors. That's the title, locked rooms and open doors. And in The Flower and the Nettle, our self-imposed exile in Europe and coming to grips with world problems. And in this final volume, she says, our combined and differing attitudes to these crises and in the process facing and enduring criticism, rejection, and calumny. Charles Lindbergh was a great hero, the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic. But he suffered tremendous criticism, rejection, and calumny during World War II. He was the victim of uh, accusations of being an isolationist, of being anti-American, anti-British, and pro-Nazi. And they had some real arguments, he and his wife Anne, about whether he should speak out about the mistakes that he felt America was making in getting into World War II. And she writes in her diary, September 15th, 1941, which was several months before America joined World War II, I begin to feel bitter Not that I do not myself feel that the speech was disastrous, but because I begin to see Charles hated much as the Jews are hated, simply because he is Lindbergh. Hugh Johnson can say the same thing in the World Telegram, but he is not crucified because he is not Lindbergh. I think how true was my vision of him as eternally that man in a plane alone, out in the middle of the ocean, headed for an impossible destination, with all the world calling him a flying fool, and only a few individuals, not understanding him, not able to follow him, left behind, looking after him with a kind of blind faith, holding him in their hearts. I sense that this is the beginning of a fight and consequent loneliness and isolation that we have not known before. I find, though I am sobered by it, that it is not so difficult to face. In a sense, it is what I faced or thought I faced when I married. 
How strange it is that one makes the choice implied in marriage not once, but over and over again. Are you or aren't you? Yes or no? I find it is again quite clearly yes. This is my life. I must remember this when it gets hard for me, for I am really much more attached to the worldly things than he is. Mind more giving up friends, popularity, etc. Mind much more criticism and coldness and loneliness. And she ends this diary entry with these few personal words. We sleep again in the little tent out on the hill with the wind blowing. Charles says he sleeps deeply and well, but I lie awake and think. Our portion is assigned. There are the tough times. If we experience, if we should experience fame, such as Lindbergh experienced, which is not likely for very many of us, we will also experience the criticism, the isolation, the rejection, the calumny. But let me read you a little poem that may explain what's going on. It's called The Weaver. My life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors. He worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent, and the shuttles cease to fly, shall God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The next to the last in the series on The Path of Loneliness. Gateway to Joy 21, Loneliness, My Portion, is a Sign. Later on, we'll be hearing from radio host Bob Lapine, and he'll be talking about Elizabeth and about truth, about struggling, but about warmth. That coming later. Right now, let's hear from Frank Kohlinger. For decades, he ministered in the country of Ecuador, and he still travels back to uh, minister there. But what did missionary Frank Kohlinger think of Elizabeth when it came to commitment? As far as her way of doing things. They were very precise and uh, orderly, especially things she wrote down concerning the language and her studies and desires to serve the Lord. So uh, that that always comes to mind, as was her husband Jim and and the other men. And looking over the the biographies that I've read about them, there seemed to be a a real uh, closeness to the Lord, a desire to serve Him, a willing to sacrifice perhaps more so than uh, in today's missionaries who go. And uh, seeing newer missionaries who have come, not the fact that they're not led of the Lord, but there just seemed to be a more of a consecration, a seriousness, and willingness to do things that um, you don't always see today in the newer, younger generation. Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger. Later on, we'll be hearing from Bob Lapine, radio host, talking about truth and struggling when it came to the life of Elizabeth. Right now, the final program in the eight-part series, The Path of Loneliness, Gateway to Joy 22, a love that will never let go. It is not experiences that change us. As I mentioned in my last talk, People's lives pretty much fall into similar patterns, good things and bad things, obstacles and smooth roads, steep hills, deep rivers to cross. But it's not the steep hills and the deep rivers that change us. It is our response. A Christian's response should be very different from that of a non-Christian. Sometimes... People call themselves Christians, and you could study their lives minutely, and you might have a great difficulty in discovering that there was really very much difference between them and anybody else. I know some Christians in whom the difference is obvious. The difference is radical. And I'd like to tell you the story today about a very lonely man, a man who experienced one of the most poignant forms of loneliness, rejection by his fiancée. His name was George Matheson, and George Matheson was engaged when he went blind, 
And when he became blind, his fiancée decided that she did not want to be stuck with a blind man as a husband, and she broke the engagement. Now, what exactly did Matheson do? Well, for one thing, he wrote a, a poem which has become a hymn, one of my favorite hymns, and I think it describes the process of what he went through in his grief and loneliness. These are his words. O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. That's just the first stanza, and I'd like for us to think about that for a minute. O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. He gave back his life. He surrendered himself. And through that, he discovered that in thine ocean depths, its flow could richer and fuller be. His blindness and rejection proved to be for George Matheson the very means of illuminating the love of God. He may have asked the age-old question, why? But God's answer is always, trust me. Matheson turned his thoughts away from the woman he had lost, away from the powerful temptations to self-pity, resentment, and bitterness at God, skepticism of his word, and selfish isolation which might so quickly have overcome him, and he lifted up his weary soul to a far greater love, one that would never let him go. Have you ever been rejected by someone you loved? Perhaps not a fiancé, but someone on whom you really counted, someone that you had assumed, perhaps for years, really loved you. And then, in a strange and unexpected way, that person has turned from you, and you've known the desolation that George Matheson experienced. The woman who had promised her life to him decides, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth the price with a blind man. Where do you turn? He turned to the love that will never let go, the love of God. He gave him back his life. So often we have misgivings about turning over our lives to God, imagining that we're going to lose everything that matters. As I think I've told you, I live on the ocean, and I think a lot about the ocean and about the tiny shells that we can find in the tide pool in front of our house. Suppose that tiny shell, lying in a dry spot on low tide, was afraid to give up the teaspoonful of water that it holds lest there not be enough in the ocean to fill it up again. I think our hesitancy to turn over our lives to God would be like that of the tiny shell. Is there enough in God to fill our hearts? Lose your life, said Jesus, and you will find it. Give up, and I will give you everything. As Janet Erskine Stewart puts it, if we get our own way, we get only a hideous little idol to nurse. If we give it up, we get God. Can the shell imagine the depth and the plenitude of the ocean? Can you and I fathom the riches and the fullness of God's love? In his blindness, George Matheson must have thought a great deal about light. There is a second stanza to the hymn that George Matheson wrote. It says... O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray that in thy sunshine's blaze its day may brighter, fairer be. Wouldn't you imagine that a man who goes blind would think a great deal about light? He says, O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. A flickering torch. Does that mean that he has to sacrifice his only source of light? He yields. When his heart restores its borrowed ray, 
what happens? In place of his own dim torch, he is given God's sunshine blaze. Because the thing that he longed for, the joy of his life was gone, he cried out in his desperation to another joy, to the source of joy itself. And here's the third stanza. O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. I cannot close my heart to thee. Think about that. I wonder if for a moment or two Matheson might have felt the way I sometimes do. I will not relinquish this misery, not right now. God has taken away what I most wanted. I have a right to feel sorry for myself. I have been wronged. I will refuse, for a while at least, any offers of comfort and healing. Don't speak to me of joy. You pour salt in my wounds. I just want to lie in the corner and lick them for a little while. If any such very natural thoughts entered Matheson's mind, as I imagine they did, God understood, for he had been a man too. In his mercy, he helped him to put them away and to write, I cannot close my heart to thee. That is the response of a humbled heart, one that admits its poverty and recognizes the gentle love that waits, the joy that is seeking him precisely because he is in such pain that he can hardly seek anything but death. Then, even though he is blind, he sees with the eye of faith, and what he sees through the mist of his tears is a rainbow. He comes to believe that the promise is true. Tears are not forever. Sorrow is never forever. There will be a mourning without them. His faith lays hold of the promise, and mysteriously he finds that pain has been exchanged for joy. I've known that too. That's happened many times in my life. If Matheson, or you or I, close our hearts and indulge our feelings, we may find some miserably meager happiness. But we would forfeit the joy, and it's joy that he writes about in that third stanza. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain. It's God. That joy is God seeking you through pain. But you say, if God loves me, he'll make me happy. Well, yes and no. Happy isn't the word, really. It's joy, a better thing, a far better thing. Not sentiment, not mere feeling good, but something that can never be taken away. Love, light, and joy. There is yet something else that the God who is love and the Father of lights and the source of all joy wants to give us. It's the cross. Will we accept that? It can always be evaded, but if it is, the result is endless loss. Matheson writes about that, too. O cross that liftest up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red life that shall endless be. I dare not ask to fly from thee, he says. By this time he understands what he would be rejecting. With both hands, as it were, he takes it, says yes, surrenders, lays everything he holds dear, life's glory, down in the dust. That was Gateway to Joy 22, The Path of Loneliness, Part 8. The conclusion in the series, A Love That Will Never Let Go. Well, before we go, let's hear from Bob Lapine. He spent nearly three decades hosting Family Life Today, Family Life's nationally syndicated radio program. Well, we've been thinking about loneliness, and part of what comes to mind for Bob when he thinks about Elizabeth is struggling, but much more. When I think about Elizabeth, I think about uh, John chapter 1, where Jesus is described as being full of grace, and full of truth. And I think for most of us, we're well aware of the fact that Elizabeth was full of truth. Her life was anchored in the truth. She didn't have much patience for those who wanted to shade or soften the truth. She was one who spoke the truth kindly, 
but firmly. She spoke the truth in love. In fact, I remember her, uh, she she kind of famously said this. She said, uh, a lot of people will say today, I'm struggling with this or I'm struggling with that. And Elizabeth just cut right to the chase and she said, you know, for many of them, struggling is simply uh, another word for disobedience. If we say we're struggling with something, we're often not obeying. At the same time, I don't think many people recognized the compassion and the warmth and the love and the genuine caring that was a part of who Elizabeth Elliot was. Uh, We knew her for her truth, but anyone who got to spend time with her also knew that she was someone who spoke the truth in love and who was full of both grace and truth. And I think that's what I remember about her maybe as much as anything else. Longtime radio host Bob Lapine. Have you been thinking about loneliness with us during this series? Elizabeth once said, The will of God is not something you add to your life. It's a course you choose. You either line yourself up with the Son of God, or you capitulate to the principle which governs the rest of the world. She said, one does not surrender a life in an instant. That which is lifelong can only be surrendered in a lifetime. Well, it looks as though our time together is coming to an end. But before it does, let me thank you for joining us today. Whether at home, at the office, maybe as you took a walk, wherever we found you today, thanks for coming along. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources at elizabethelliot.org. elizabethelliot.org for more lectures, talks, devotionals, Gateway to Joy programs, and other resources. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love. Underneath or what? Underneath are the everlasting arms 